that work? And okay. Justin, you're ready with the slides, is that correct? Yes, yes, okay. I have the, I have the uh, share and everything uh, queued up already. Okay, and Nancy, during her uh, part of the agenda, she will tell you when to advance. Okay. So Nancy, did you see that Justin will be doing the advancing of your slides? Okay. Uh, panelists, if you can remember, when you're not up, put your um, mute on, but keep your uh, cursor right next to the mute. Makes it easy to turn it back on. So you just want to keep distractions uh, from our side um, from the people who are attending. Yes, and captions are ready. Uh, we are live on Facebook, and we are going to go live. <clears throat> are we all ready? I think so. Okay. So we'll go live in three, two, and one. Well, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this uh, afternoon, this early evening. Um, welcome to the session tonight. It's a learning from, from our history, living beyond the walls of the institution. I first would like to thank the Disability Pride Virtual um, PA 2020 and Vicki Landers for organizing the 30 days um, for the ADA, including our session. Um, just some housekeeping. Uh, all attendees will be muted. Um, we will provide, uh, uh, attendees can provide any uh, comments they want um, uh, or questions via chat bar. And Mary Hartley uh, will be serving as our chat monitor. Um, captions and American Sign Language are provided for those who require and, and need such. Uh, this event is being live streamed on Facebook as well, and the session is being uh, recorded and will be available, available on the YouTube channel on Disability Pride Virtual PA 2020. And our stop time is uh, 6 uh, p.m. Uh, and if people have additional questions after that, they can contact uh, the various um, uh, agencies who are uh, participating in, in this event. Um, uh, Justin, can you share the first slide, please? Um, I'd like to um, acknowledge the sponsors of this event, uh, Western Pennsylvania Disability and ha uh, History and Action Consortium, also the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University, the Pennhurst Memorial and Preservation Alliance, and ADA 30, uh, Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. Um, also, I'd like to recognize uh, two uh, references for this. Um, Justin, you can advance the slide, please. And one is the Pennhurst and the Struggle for Disability Rights, uh, which is edited by Dennis Downey and Jim Conroy. Um, just came out in 2020 uh, as an ebook and as a hard copy book. And also Lost in a Desert World, the autobiography of Roland Johnson, who was just an amazing self-advocate here in Pennsylvania, who had lived in Pennhurst. And it's really a, a book about his uh, journey uh, from Pennhurst and into self-advocacy. Um, our presentation today is really in three parts. Um, where do we come from? Uh, it will be part one, uh, part two, where we are now, and then part three, where we are going. So we're going to start with part one. And before doing so, I'd like to ask each panelist to very briefly introduce themselves. And why don't we start with Brenda Dare to introduce herself. Hello everyone, my name is Brenda Dare. I currently work as an independent living project manager for Transitional Paths to Independent Living, a center for independent living serving Washington, Green, and Fayette counties. I am a survivor of childhood institutionalization and I am now a proud homeowner in Allegheny County. And I'm so thrilled to be with you today. Well, thank you, Brenda. Uh, great to have you as well. Uh, Jamie, can you please introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Jamie Ray Leonetti. I am currently the Associate Director of Policy at Temple Institute on Disabilities in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm also a person with a disability, and uh, I'm very glad to be here today. Thanks. Great. And Nancy Thaler, can you please introduce yourself? 
Hi, I'm Nancy Thaler. Um, those of you who know me may know me as the former Deputy Secretary for the Office of Developmental Programs, uh, a role I served in twice. Um, I retired in 2018 and I still do some work for the department. Um, I focus on uh, children who have medically complex conditions. Um, more and more coming along these days and we need to be um, more creative in how we enable them to live with their families and in the community. Good. Well, thank you, Nancy. Uh, I see Debbie, you're with us. Could you please introduce yourself? Debbie Robinson? Um, she's in the ladies room. I'm her aide setting up. She'll be here momentarily. Okay, I can introduce Debbie then. Um, okay. Debbie is the executive director of Speaking for Ourselves, uh, a nationally recognized advocacy organization that advocates for people with disabilities and educates the public about self-advocacy and the potential of people with disabilities. Uh, before joining Speaking for Ourselves, Debbie was active in the disability movement in New York State. Interestingly, Debbie was also um, present at the signing of the ADA in 1990, which is quite, a, quite amazing since we're celebrating 30 years of the, the ADA. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, uh, Judith uh, Grand. Judith, uh, would you want to just give a quick introduction of yourself? Go ahead, Judith. Hi. Um, I, uh, I'm a lawyer. I currently practice at a firm called Reisman Corolla Grand and Zuba, which specializes in disability okay. law. Before that, I worked at the Public Interest Law Center of Philadelphia, which uh, represented the ARC of Pennsylvania and the plaintiff class in the Pennhurst litigation. And I was the lead attorney for the ARC um, throughout most of the implementation period of the settlement in Pennhurst. Well, thank you so much, uh, Judith. And just uh, um, I'm Guy Caruso. I'm going to be facilitating today's uh, session, and I work with the Institute on Disabilities at Temple University with Jamie, uh, and I'm in the Western office out in the Pittsburgh area. So we're going to jump right in then to our uh, part one of the session, where we come from. I was going to ask Nancy uh, Thaler to really share her perspective um, and what things were like for people with disabilities and families pre-Pennhurst and then uh, during the Pennhurst period. So Nancy, could you please uh, start us off? Will do. And Justin, can you put my slides up? I think that uh, a picture can be worth a thousand words, as they say. And so I did three slides to short, sort of show a before and after. So this is a discussion about before Pennhurst and after Pennhurst. And the story before Pennhurst, and, and you could use any other institution, Willowbrook, Partlow, um, at, in the early 70s, in every state, there existed pretty much only large state institutions. And before the 1970s, um, no education, no public education. So families who had young children um, knew that they had to homeschool forever. No community services. The only thing really available to people were institutional services. And many families um, had a difficult decision to make. Many families said no, never and their family members never went to the institution. But for many families, as the years progressed, it became more and more difficult as they had more children and more issues in their family. And so we, of course, saw the institutional population grow over that time. But in 1970, there was a lot of change in the air, a lot of change in the air. The uh, Pennsylvania ARC, the ARC, um, filed a lawsuit for the right uh, of all children to go to public school. That case settled in 1972 became the foundation for the national statute um, that gave every child the right to go to public school. And the next slide later, I'm gonna speak to that because it had a profound impact on uh, institutions. Uh, not long after that, the federal government passed the Rehabilitation Act and in it was section 504 explicitly giving people access to the community. And many people say that if Section 504 had been fully implemented, we wouldn't have needed the ADA. But of course it wasn't, years went before there were regulations. The Pennhurst case was filed in 1974, but there was a lot of noise before it was filed. A lot of publicity, a lot of investigations, a lot of advocacy that culminated in the course being filed, uh, the case being filed in 1974. 
And if you sculpt up and looked at the national picture, you will see that happening in other states as well. Um, this history um, from 19, early 1970s to now is a history that's really been written by people with disabilities, their families, advocates, and allies. Um, many, many people suffered to get to where we are today. Many people with disabilities suffered in institutions. Families suffered trying to make do at home. Um, advocates and allies standing by them. I will say that government, both at the state level and the federal government, came along. They came along in response to lawsuits and uh, lobbying and advocacy, um, but the real champions who wrote this story are people with disabilities, families, and their advocates and allies. So it, it seems like it seemed during the time like forever, but actually, when we look at the time frame, within 10 or 15 years, we got the Medicaid waiver, which became the federal government's financing for all home and community-based services. We had the Americans with Disabilities Act, which opened up opportunities. We had the Olmstead decision in 1999, which said federal state governments are obligated to make the most integrated setting available. And then we had adoption of the home and community-based rule which was based on Olmstead, which requires states to describe and to implement full integration of services. So in that span of time, um, a great deal has been accomplished. Next slide. The next two slides are um, sort of a picture of, um, of this story. This is the, um, uh, a graph, a bar graph of the census and in public institutions in the United States um, this is published by the University of Minnesota. They've been tracking data ever since then. Um, and if you hide your panelist slide, you can see where it goes all the way um, to the end of uh, to 2016. But we start in 1880 with 2,400 people. Our peak is around 1966. And I have a little arrow that shows 1970. And then you see a precipitous fall of people living in public institutions. And a lot of that has to do with the right to education. Because once the right to education was passed, which really is like ADA Olmstead for kids, because it gave every child the right to be integrated into a public school, children just stopped being referred to institutions. And so we saw very few admissions of children. And because of advocacy, um, the departure of adults, and it simply continued at a constant pace until 2016. Uh, the data shows there are a little under 20,000 people. It's 2020 today, so the data is going to look better than that. Um, and that march continues. Next slide. And last slide. This is uh, published by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. This shows the federal government's expenditures in institutions and in home and community-based services. And the home and community-based services and institutions in this graph include services for people who are aging, who are physically disabled, all disabilities, as well as intellectual disabilities and autism, developmental disabilities, et cetera. But what it shows is that around 2013, the federal funding for institutions dropped and the funding for home and community-based services increased until they crossed. And we now see an ongoing rise in the amount of money spent in the community and the amount of money going into institutions. And so um, I think this is a great accomplishment and it's the right trend line and I think the reason to look at these accomplishments is because um, they often say we learn from history. If we don't know our history, we're doomed to repeat it. Well, in this case, our history is full of considerable successes and setting the path in the right direction. And it should encourage all of us to keep building this pathway, to keep pushing and advocating and litigating if we have to, to until every single person has the ability and the opportunity and the support services to live where they want, with their families, on their own, in the community, with a real job and contributing to um, the life of our community. That's um, 
the end of my brief presentation on our history. Well, Nancy, thank you so much. Now, um, att attendees, um, please, um, if you have questions, responses, or reflections on what Nancy just shared, uh, please put those into the chat and Mary Hartley will share that with us and Nancy can uh, respond to those chats or some other people can respond to those chats. I do wanna um, um, re-emphasize a new book that has come out, Pennhurst and the Struggle for Disability Rights, uh, edited by Dennis Downey and Jim Conroy. And it just came out in 2020 and it really um, was the work of those, those uh, gentlemen as well as the Pennsylvania uh, uh, Memorial and Preservation Alliance, who's really worked to try to keep um, the Pennhurst alive in the sense of what it represents here in Pennsylvania, as well as what it represents on a national scale in regards to the, um, the, the litigation and the settlement uh, from Pennhurst. So that's a great book to look at, to learn what's taken place. And again, I mentioned um, Roland Johnson's uh, wonderful book, Lost in a Desert World, which is his autobiography about living at Pennhurst. Now, um, when this event was being set up, um, people were asked to view three films, or at least to take a chance to look at three films. And um, I just want to mention those three films and then open it up to any chat uh, comments that people might have. But one of the films um, that the Institute on Disabilities was able to put together from a grant from the United Way of Southwest Pennsylvania was from Wrongs to Rights. It was a very short film, but it really captures, in a sense, what took place in Western Pennsylvania and around the state uh, around these issues of institutionalization and some of the horrors, unfortunately, that took place uh, in Polk um, Institution up in uh, Polk, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, then there also was the film I Go Home, which is really about Pennhurst. Um, uh, uh, it's a wonderful film that came out a few years ago. Um, and then the third film that people were asked to look at was Valuing Lives by um, Wolf Wolfsberger and the Principle of Normalization. And as Nancy shared some of this history, there's so many things happening that were sort of united with the parent movement, uh, with uh, exposés that were taking place, with um, Wolfensberger had taken a concept from Scandinavia called normalization that really gave us a language as to how to think about change for people because we really didn't know because the institution, as Nancy indicated, was the only show in town for many people other than staying at home. Um, and the Wolfensberger you know, pushed that concept, trained people around the country and that led to change. So let's see if uh, there's any questions that people uh, have offered. Uh, Mary, are there some comments or chats that you'd like to share with us? Uh, just a few, um, some praise from uh, Bob Nelkin and uh, to Nancy for, for the presentation. Um, and Elisa, I'm gonna get this wrong, Elisa. Elisa Grishman, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, she really responded to I Go Home uh, the film and thought all the films were outstanding. Well, thank you so much. If there's other comments from uh, attendees about the films themselves, we weren't intending to take a lot of time uh, in our presentation here today, but certainly if there's comments, reflections, how the films uh, uh, piqued your interest, uh, what you sort of learned from the films, feel free to share some of that with us. Uh, are there other comments, Nancy or uh, Mary? No, that that's it for now. Okay. Well, I do. Guy, if I could for a second, I'd like sure, to ask Brenda. Nancy that second slide with the green bar graph. Did that include persons who lived in nursing homes as well, or was that just state established institutions? You're on mute. That slide is exclusively people who lived in state operated institutions for people who had different labels during those years. It's decades right. and decades, but it's only publicly operated institutions for people with intellectual disabilities. Okay. So if we were to extrapolate that data, we would see that um, those bars would rise a little bit higher and would be falling, but perhaps at a bit slower rate uh, with the implementation of home and community-based services. I just wanted to clarify that for our viewers. Mary, do you have some other comments? I'm good. I just wanted to give a shout out to Bob Nelkin. I'm so glad that he's joining us today. Uh, Bob is the person who hel helped get the film From Wrongs to Rights made, uh, so generously um, funding that film from uh, the uh, United Way of Southwest Pennsylvania. And, and Bob was a crusader, along with a number of family members, 
um, uh, uh, Ginny Thornburg and others in Western Pennsylvania who visited institutions around the Commonwealth to really see what the conditions were like and uh, uh, made various reports. And uh, uh, Bob's papers are actually, uh, uh, they've been preserved. So if you're interested uh, um, on our Western Pennsylvania Disability History and Action Consortium website, you can find a place to go to actually look at some of those original documents uh, that Bob has from when he visited uh, institutions in Pennsylvania. So, so Guy, we did have one other question, and that was from, I hope I get your pronunciation correct, Hend Guma. She asked if the Pennhurst lawsuits have been taught in school. She had never heard of it, and she had never heard of the videos. So Nancy, do you want to talk about that? Um, I'm not surprised. Um, I don't think that in our school systems, we teach much about disability policy or disability issues. Um, that said, one of the good things about education is people with disabilities are there and present and integrated. And um, while there's a lot more the education system can do, we have to remember that they were in the forefront of doing this, of opening the doors and including people. And many of you, I'm sure, have stories about when it works. It works really wonderfully well. And it means that people are growing up, people without disabilities are growing up with people with disabilities, and they're leaving their education system, and they're going into all walks of life. They're the construction supervisor. They're the lady at the pharmacy, or the pharmacist, or they are the judge. And the presence of people with disabilities in the public school system has done everything to educate non-disabled people about people are people and everybody deserves an opportunity and they can be your friend. Um, and I think that's the most important lesson that kids learn in school. Um, Vicki Landers has mentioned that to watch the education policy forum tomorrow at 2 p.m., which will talk a bit more about this, this history. Uh, but as Nancy's indicating, you know, um, there's a lot that's not known about disability history. As we're finding out, there's a lot not known about um, black history either or women's history. Um, so, so much of, uh, I think the three films were trying to raise consciousness to try to really bring this to people's attention as to what, what has been um, and what is and where, where do we want to go about this. And I know for me personally, when I went to school, you didn't see students with disabilities. And if you did, they were in the basement of the school and that's where they stayed. Now, when my sons went to school and my other kids, they were in classes with students with disabilities and it changed their whole perspective. And they didn't have to undo a lot of what many of us have to undo because we, we didn't have that um, inclusive background uh, in many ways. Um, Mary, there's some other comments? Yes. Um, so Melissa Clark was asking, a couple people were talking about um, different things that have happened over the years. The timing of Bill Baldini's Suffer the Little Children mm -hmm. um, and its impact in 1968. Um, and that was from Dennis Downey. Um, and Melissa Clark asked, has anybody seen Crip Camp, the documentary on Netflix? Yep. I'll be talking um, a little bit about that in my, in my comments. Okay, up. so we'll leave that for that. That'll be, t we'll be talking a little bit about that soon. Well, and you know, I'm a New Yorker by background, and for me, a lot of this was seeing Willowbrook on, you know, on the evening news with Geraldo Rivera, and um, just seeing the horror, the black and white pictures of people living in squalor. It was reminiscent of photos I had seen of concentration camps in Nazi Germany, and it was just such a wake-up call to see that treatment of people. And I came from New York State, which is the Empire State, you know, and you just it was beyond belief that this is how we were treating people with disabilities. So um, a lot of this history is uh, uh, not known and we're you know, obviously trying to, uh, our Western Pennsylvania Disability History and Action Consortium, please see our, we our website. We have a, a wonderful um, historical timeline of what took place in Western Pennsylvania um, and, and around the country in some sense. So I think this disability history is uh, really funding a, a, a people are really becoming much more interested in, in what's been occurring. Um, Mary, any other comments? No, we're good for now. Thank you. Great. 
Um, any other reflections by the panelists on um, any of the three films that uh, um, were, were made? I know, Nancy, you were uh, in two of the films. You, you had a prominent uh, spot. But any comments you'd like to make uh, about the, you know, your participation in the films? You're still on mute, Nancy. There you um, go. Not, not specifically about the films, but um, they are very powerful. And um, I hope that people will build their own libraries with links so that when you are at meetings or with people, you can link to them. And as you know, as I said in my presentation, a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, so I'm grateful to all the people who have been building this library of, of videos because it's priceless. Yeah, uh, in the film I Go Home, uh, the Bill Baldini um, work is, is very much covered because it was so instrumental uh, to really bringing Pennhurst you know, to the public light. Um, and um, again, we owe such a gratitude to, to, to the work that he did. And, in other cities as, as well, I'm going to forget the, the person in, in Pittsburgh, but equally, journalists have done a, an amazing job of uncovering what takes place um, um, in settings for people with disabilities, and that has a, a big change factor. Yes, Nancy. Yeah, I do want to add something. Um, the reason it's important for a, a significant number of people to know the history is because it is true, you can be doomed to repeat it. And I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with the phenomenon of Holocaust deniers, people who want to believe that's not true and deny it, um, which is denying people their experience and their, and their history. So it is important that there be a significant number of people always knowledgeable, aware, and articulate about this phenomenon of institutionalization. And the reason you have to remember it and know it is because it never goes away. This tendency to want to congregate people and isolate them, sound familiar, at the border, the Japanese during World War II, we have this tendency in um, our DNA somehow to want to do this, sometimes because we think it will be better, it's never better. And so we've got to constantly be on guard about this new idea that comes up about why don't we build this place or get this farm or buy this building and everybody will go there and the services will be special. Special is never equal. It's not even adequate and it's dangerous. It's why each and every one of us wants to do everything in our power to never go to a nursing home because we know when we go there, we will be anonymous and we will be lost. So please do your role in making sure people know this history enough so we don't repeat it. Yeah, thank you, Nancy, very much. And we're gonna cover a little bit of that as we go along. And the, you know, the closing um, sort of clips in the Valuing Lives film really does speak to that uh, very clearly. And um, new disability groups oftentimes don't um, do their homework about the history and they're prone to repeat what's taken place as Nancy was indicating. Mary, I think you said you wanted to share something. Yeah, just a couple comments here. Um, first, uh, Bob Nelkin was talking about using media, you know, this Bill Baldini thing, the Geraldo Rivera, um, but also news uh, outlets uh, to make the public aware of these atrocities and put pressure on elected officials was a key element of past change along with political action. In the current very different media environment, how do we get mass understanding of what should happen today and in the future? I just wanted to think who, who would like to take that question? This is Nancy. I'm just going to say something quick. In our society right now, social justice is a prominent topic, and we're talking about diversity. Disability is part of that diversity mm -hmm. environment. And so I think both supporting those efforts and including disability language and references when we're with people and joining them is another way to build community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and going and sort of coupling with that and not because they're the same, but you know, this media idea, the social media idea or other kinds of outlets that we can use today. Um, I think there's been a lot of work around this area. I'd love to uh, continue that conversation, um, but, Likewise, to Nancy's point, 
uh, Christy Troutman had, had stated that this is a stunning history of a struggle for liberation that most people don't know. And uh, she agrees with Guy's comment that there's also a lack of knowledge about the history of racial segregation and oppression. We were just talking about this on a call today. Um, do any of the panelists want to comment on the ways the history of racism and of disability oppression intersect? It's Brenda. I'll be talking a little bit about the need for those intersections um, and for honoring those intersections when we get to my comments a little bit. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, because I think it's, it's critical that we acknowledge how our movements have taken from one another, but also how we have to support one another moving forward. Mm -hmm. So just a little historical artifact. Um, there are institutions, New Jersey comes to mind, but other institutions that within the public institutional system for people with disabilities, there was still racial segregation. There were buildings and properties that were <coughs> only for African American people with disabilities, women with disabilities, so we segregated within our segregation. Yeah, it's a history that's not really known, Nancy, but uh, you're absolutely correct. Um, and Guy, if I could just take a moment to comment on something that Nancy said a few minutes ago, um, which was, you know, recognizing that uh, disability is a part of diversity. And I think that so often that gets lost in the discussion. So thank you, Nancy, for bringing that up. And I, I think one place where I really noticed it in the films that we previewed um, was in the film uh, Wrongs to Rights. Um, I remember a clip uh, featuring Roland Johnson and um, he kept asking the question, who's in charge? Uh, and that question really resonated with me. And if Roland were here right now, I would wanna thank him for putting that question in the minds of not just people with disabilities, but all people, because I think that, um, you know, it's, it's a very helpful question to consider when we think about um, what is the future going to look like for people with disabilities in our community. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would, um, you know, kind of give a call to action to the people with disabilities who may be participating in this uh, webinar today to really think about that question of who's in charge. And if the answer that you come up with for yourself is that you want to be in charge, you want to be in charge of your own life, then, you know, participating in something like this is a great start but make sure that you're out there and you're out front getting your voice heard when these disability issues come up. Because if not, we do risk going backwards. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, uh, Guy, this is Debbie. I was gonna use that in my opening statement, <laughs> actually, and I know exactly where that came from because uh, Roland taught me, he was my teacher. Um, when I first came out. So I, I was taught by Roland the advocacy and that's, and who's in charge is what he's, uh, that came from the everyday lives. Our, when we were first at the everyday lives, we were the only self-advocacy group there. Mm -hmm. And he used that because he knew that that's, uh, he knew that um, you made a statement with that, uh, at the first everyday lives when speaking for herself was the only self-advocacy group there Thanks, that he said he was in charge and you know we should be in charge of our everyday lives and that's where he brought that up at the yeah, everyday so lives much, conference. i'm glad you spoke up i was going to call, call on you because i know you and roland were very close friends and uh, that he was your mentor yes. um, again i i really uh um you know, if you get a chance to, to look at Roland's book, it's uh, Lost in a Desert World. It's, it's well worth the, the read because he really shares uh, uh, both his history growing up and his Pennhurst years, but also his advocacy. Um, any other comments, Mary, that uh, you want to share? I've, I've seen a lot of action with people um, giving different references and resources. Anything else to share? Yeah, there's, there's so much great chat here. I do in the chat as well. Um, we can certainly post it to our History Consortium website. Um, I just want to say there's a lot on here about eugenics, 
mm -hmm. um, and how disability rights and um, the challenges of racism were actually intersected in many ways. We, uh, you know, somebody had mentioned that, but we certainly learned about the right to education through that, the movement um, and the right to, to desegregation. So, um, so there's a whole, whole lot of great information on here. Um, I think that um, there's some, some good, uh, Lynn Takelet from the School of Dental Medicine talks about teaching this to her students. Um, and this history, and there's just, there's so much good information on here. I, I, I hope we can share it out after the meeting. Thank you so much, Mary. I, I know um, in some of my teachings around the dis uh, history of disability, uh, teaching to professionals in the medical field is so important because they have such an impact on the lives of people and really understanding, uh, most have no idea of what this history has been like, and it really does change their perspective um, and, and really puts the person with a disability at the forefront of really um, their own medical care and, and being listened to. So it's so, so crucial. Anything else from the panelists before we move on to section two of our uh, session? So uh, Christina Rood published Who's in Charge was an, was an, so Who's in Charge was an advocacy group. And I wanted to just confirm that that was a, the case. And if there's any information about it. Yeah, um, it really was a, um, the advocacy group was speaking for ourselves that Debbie uh, Robinson, who's with us today, is the executive director of, but that was a, just a statement, a sort of a mantra that Roland Johnson would, would share about who's in charge, okay. is my remembrance. Debbie, do you remember it differently? No, Roland used that a lot as um, saying that we are in charge, um, that, you know, um, of our own lives. He was in charge of what he wanted and he really made it known to everyone. And he used that as like, you're in charge. He's like saying, we're so bad because we're, you are in charge of your own lives. He made it known that he was in charge of his own life. He had his own house. He knew what he wanted and he wanted to say, that you can have the same thing that I can have. People wanted to live on their own, have their own home. I remember Roland wanted to live on his own. He had roommates, he wanted his own house and he was able to get his own house. If he can get his own house and he lived in Penhurst, uh, he came from Penhurst. Uh, so he um, trying to say people with disabilities that you in charge of your own lives, that Thank we you. are in charge. Thank you, Debbie, it's so powerful. And um, I'm sort of a recovering professional myself. And when you go to school, go to college, you, you sort of learn that you're the expert, you're supposed to make decisions for people. And it was eye-opening to me uh, to come in contact with speaking for ourselves, to listen to Roland, to listen to other people who really opened my eyes as to what my role was to be which was not to be the experts over people, but, but to support people, to listen to people. And Nancy Thaler uh, was brilliant and doing the everyday lives and bringing all the parties together so we could all learn from each other. And I think that was the crucial piece. And uh, certainly Roland, um, you know, who's in charge, really made it clear that we needed to listen much more carefully to people with disabilities about what they wanted in their lives and how could we support people and not control people. So. Um, that was really powerful. Yes, Nancy. No, I just put, I just put in the chat box. Roland gave a speech at the International Conference uh, on Disability in Toronto um, in the '90s, I think maybe 1993, and he had an audience of about eight, nine hundred people, a thousand people in this huge auditorium, and he gave a riveting speech. Debbie, you're right next to him on the stage, asking who's in charge, and it's up on YouTube. So I think if you Google, you know, Roland Johnson, Toronto, who's in charge, it should come up. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Yes, yeah, he did. Roland was a very powerful man um, with a lot of passion. So that's well worth looking at. Let, let's uh, transition into our second uh, question. We really appreciate the, uh, the comments and the chats from the audience and the resources that you're sending out to us. Um, so part two is re really is where are we now um, and I really wanted to ask Jamie to talk a bit about the uh, Home and Community-Based um, Services final rule and a push to end um, 
uh, 14C and segregated employment. So Jamie, could you talk a bit about that? Sure, thanks Guy. So as many of you um, that are participating today may know, uh, we are in a time right now nationally where we're dealing with something that's called the Home and Community-Based Services Final Settings Rule, or sometimes you might hear the Home and Community-Based Services Final Rule, um, or the HCBS Rule. So this is a federal rule that has come to us from the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, CMS, and it's actually been around for a while. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if I could ask you th that are participating, you know, I would bet that a lot of you have probably never heard of it before, even though it's been around since 2014. And I think part of the reason for that is that um, CMS recognized that this rule was going to create a change and that because it was going to create a change, um, it was going to take a while for it to be fully known and fully implemented. So what the rule basically says, and I mean, I'm really boiling it down, but you know, we don't want to talk about the dry rule all day, right? <laughs> um, but what the rule basically says is that if you receive uh, services that are funded with Medicaid dollars, so for example, in Pennsylvania waiver services, if you get those services, uh, those services need to be provided in the most integrated community type setting possible. So uh, as a recipient of those services, you have a right to do things like decide where you live, decide who you live with, uh, decide if you're going to have any roommates, um, you know, if you're living in a small group setting, which is okay under the rule, like maybe just three or four people, um, you have the right to decide how that setting is going to look. You can do your own decorating, just like I would do in my own apartment or Guy might do in his house. Um, you have the right to uh, be able to lock and unlock your doors in your home. Um, which might sound like something that's commonplace and well, doesn't everybody have the right to lock and unlock their doors? But no, prior to this rule, there was some belief, um, at least in the system, if you will, that um, people with disabilities, some of them did not necessarily need the ability to lock or unlock their own bedroom door or come and go from their home as they please. So really this rule just puts an emphasis on the ability of the person to, as Debbie has pointed out, be at the center of their own life and be in charge. Uh, and it really emphasizes the need for person-centered planning. So when we talk about person-centered planning, that leads logically to the conclusion that, you know, my life is not gonna look like Nancy's life. Nancy's life is not going to look like Brenda's life, and Brenda's life is not going to look like Debbie's life. And that is important. That's an essential component of this rule. Um, as you might imagine, there are some issues surrounding the rule. Uh, one of the issues is that if we think about it, even today in 2020, we have many disability service providers who don't necessarily provide HCBS funded services in the most community oriented or community integrated way possible. And because of that, some of those providers may have to change the way they do business in order to comply with this rule. And CMS recognized that that might be difficult, might be challenging, might even be scary for not only the providers, but maybe even for some people with disabilities who were so used to being part of a particular program or having things set up in a certain way. So because of that, the implementation period for the rule is very long. I said that it first appeared in 2014, which is true. And up until a few weeks ago, we thought that we were going to have until 2021 to come into full compliance with everything that the rule requires. Well, thank you very much, COVID-19. 
um, CMS has announced that um, we now have until 2023 to come into full compliance with the rule um, because of COVID. And I think I may have misspoke just a moment ago. Um, the original deadline was actually 2022 and it's now been extended to 2023. Um, but one of the reasons why I bring up this rule is because it, it fits right into sort of what we're seeing in society right now um, in a couple of interesting ways. I mean, on the one hand, we've seen recently a push to um, move away from institutional settings. So in Pennsylvania, we even have the Office of Developmental Programs deciding about a year ago or so now that they're going to close two of our state intellectual disability centers, our state ID centers. So the Polk Center and the Whitehaven Center. And part of the reason for that is this whole idea that people with disabilities need to have the option to be able to live in their own community with support if that's what they choose to do. So you know, on the one hand, we have that sort of institutional closure that's moving forward. And then on the other hand, we may have some people who are saying, well, wait, you know, um, what's the problem if I want to build a housing complex, for example, and say that I only want people with disabilities to have the ability to live there? You know, why is that a problem? So there's this disconnect, and I think that the rule um, really helps to, um, to address that. Um, the other thing you mentioned, Guy, was the shift away from segregated employment settings and toward competitive integrated employment. And that's the whole idea of the 14C. For those that might not know, 14C is simply uh, a designation in the law that um, gives an employer a certain certificate which allows the employer to then pay a person with a disability less simply because they have a disability. I mean that pretty much sums it up. So in Pennsylvania we currently have, and I just did a check right before the the meeting here today, looks like we have 83 um, providers that still hold these 14C certificates, which give them the ability to pay a sub-minimum wage to people with disabilities. That is a wage that is below uh, our federal or state minimum wage. And sometimes it's so low that it's even, you know, pennies for hours of work. Um, so this is a big problem, as you can imagine, in the disability community. Um, people with disabilities have reached a place where they are demanding uh, real jobs for real pay, real work for real pay, and that's that move away from the 14C certificate. Pennsylvania has made great progress. We used to have many, many more um, providers holding 14C certificates, and now we're down to 82 or 83, and I, I know that still sounds like a lot, and we have a ways to go. Uh, but I think we will get there if people with disabilities continue to um, advocate for themselves and say, uh, you know, we're capable of real work uh, with supports or without, and we demand real pay for real work. Um, now, I know we wanted to ask Debbie uh, some questions about the whole idea of institutional closure. Uh, because as the um, president of Speaking for Ourselves, um, you know, Debbie has sort of been in the trenches with this whole idea of institutional closure and the shift toward community. So Debbie, I'm wondering if, uh, you know, are you ready for some questions? You have to unmute yourself, Deb. Uh, Thank you. Uh, now I'm off mic. <laughs> Okay. So I know one of the things we wanted to ask you was, you know, as the president of Speaking for Ourselves, um, why is it that you and the advocates in your organization have been so vocal about the need for institutional closure? Well, Jamie, uh, as you know, 
I remember when I first came on board, um, uh, my first task was, I didn't know anything about institutions. So what Mark and Roland did was take me to Penhurst on the day that it was closing. So that was my first experience N coming in from New York like Guy did. I didn't know anything about institutions. Um, so my first experience was going around. Uh, uh, Mark took me to um, Penhurst and Roland was in the back seat. Then he started telling me about Penhurst. And it was funny that uh, that was the day that Penhurst was closing. And I, I was in the front seat trying to, you know, being a new kid on the block. So that was my first experience and it was scary. Uh, I, I didn't, and I just going around looking at it, it, it looked like a scary movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I was scared. Um, my second experience was when I was president of Philadelphia six months after I um, had a young lady, I had members in my organization, chapter members, that came from this particular um, institution. Um, it was Pine Hill. Um, Judy will remember, it used to be. Um, and members, um, they were they were from this institution. This one woman that was in a wheelchair, chair, her name was Betty Brittany, invited me to come in to this other institution, um, Pine Hill, it used to be called. Uh, so that was my first visit inside of one. And what I saw, I can understand why speaking for herself wanted to, uh, it, it was horrendous. It was horrible. Uh, was the worst thing I have ever seen. Um, kids, uh, people uh, in bed and look like it was in cages. It was horrible. Uh, I, you know, and also with Roland and Mark telling me the history about, and, and Penhurst at the same time, I had some ideas and our members in Philadelphia came from institutions. Our members came from Penhurst. And so that was their passion. And um, Roland always taught me um, they're the driving force. The members drove, uh, speaking for ourselves, members drove us to this point because the majority of them came from Penhurst or from other institutions. Thank, thank you, Debbie. It's um, really eye-opening. Um, Jamie, do you have some other questions for, for Debbie, or do you want to share some things about the closures uh, happening here in Pennsylvania? Um, actually, I want to ask Debbie if she has anything else uh, she would like to share as we're yeah, talking I, about this whole issue of the closures. I wanted to share something um, that um, Roland and Speaking for Herself also started was this national movement uh, um, that we had started. Um, and also it, it was the um, Close the Door campaign um, uh, for the national movement. Um, because this became national. As you heard, I think Nancy said there was other institutions. Um, SAU, uh, Self-Advocates Becoming Empowered, which Speaking for Ourself also helped start it, which is a national movement. Out of that, um, Speaking for Ourself helped, helped them also look nationally, and they came up with Close the Door Campaign, mm -hmm. um, which um, nationally had to do with um, dealing with institutional um, people and institutions national, not just Pennsylvania, all over the world, all over the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so we came up with a help them get a national movement called Close the Door Campaign. And we had a committee uh, to deal with that. I was speaking for myself, had a committee um, that I was in charge of, and that committee was only to deal with closure. Like we helped close Lawton Center, Lawton Institutions. Uh, so we um, you know, and help people, and not just closure, but I wanted to add that we also supported and helped with the transition, help people 
um, transition to the community, work with the families, uh, work with the divided agencies. We just didn't dump them in there and without support or any kind of help. So we work with the community and their families to help with the move as well. Thank you so much, Transition. Debbie. Um, Jamie, is there anything else you wanted to share about the, you know, the closures that have been talked about here in Pennsylvania? And you're on a mute, Jamie, if you're there. Yes, guys, sorry about that. Um, I would just mention that um, the whole closure process is continuing in Pennsylvania. I mean, we've had some, um, a slowdown, I guess you would say, because of the whole um, COVID-19 adventure that we've all been on, if you will. Um, but I know that the Office of Developmental Programs is continuing with their plan to close the two state centers that I identified and to help all of the residents of those two um, centers to look at the whole idea of what they would like their everyday life to look like, mm -hmm. to do some person-centered planning and to make you know a personal and an informed choice about where they would like to live next. Thank, thank you, Jamie. We're going to um, hear from Brenda Dare next, but we will take some time in the chat to discuss this issue uh, that uh, Debbie and Jamie just spoke to. But I really would like Brenda to talk a bit about issues people with disabilities have to remain independent. As it's, it's you know, getting people out of segregated settings obviously is very important, but equally as many people who aren't living in segregated settings, but still struggle with the question of independence. So Brenda, could you share from your experience at the Centers for Independent Living um, what you're thinking? Uh, Brenda, you're on, you're on mute. You have to take your thing off. And here I thought I wouldn't get caught today with the mute button. <laughs> um, I, I do want to talk about what we need now, but I also want to give a little bit of voice to those who look at the institutional closure issue and say, but there are families who think it's a bad idea. I understand where those families are coming from with very disabled loved ones who've lived in an institutional setting perhaps their whole lives. What they're experiencing is fear. And that fear is grounded if you've experienced a failure in the community-based support system. But that's not a reason to keep someone locked behind walls. That failure in the system is part of what we need to address to, remove, to remain independent and move forward. Because the first thing we as the disability community need is unity. We have to realize this isn't just about physical disabilities. This isn't just about cognitive disabilities or just about autism. And funding sources and support schemes strive to silo us in a way that's really destructive. And we in Pennsylvania have been at the forefront of trying to erase some of those silos and to bring unity to the disability community. But it's a challenge. Every day it's a challenge. And it starts... I think in little ways, as a person with multiple disabilities, I've always worked in the disability services field. So I'm lucky there that it's been based in personal experiences. But even in disability spaces, when I speak up and say, the handouts in this meeting are not accessible, or we need to make sure there's an interpreter, even if you don't think there's gonna be anyone who's deaf in the audience. A lot of times, even in disability spaces, those statements solicit eye rolls and we have to be willing to stand up to those eye rolls and to say no all means all and i think in western pennsylvania we champion that very well but we have to remember to continue that because every time we say to somebody it's all right we'll cut out that support to to stay under budget for this event we shortchange ourselves because if we don't practice unity we can't preach it the next thing I think we need are strong supports and not just government funded supports. We have to look at building supports within our own community. The COVID crisis has really brought to light the shortcomings of the formalized support system and some real innovations in the informal support systems that we're able to build for ourselves. 
There are mutual aid communities springing up all over the internet for people with disabilities to support one another who say, okay, maybe you're somebody who can't get out because you've got health challenges that mean it's not safe to be out right now, but maybe you can help somebody else with phone calls. And maybe that person who's not so great at communicating um, has different health challenges and they can go to the grocery store. And I think it's important that we tap into these things. Also that we as a service system start funding some of those grassroots projects with seed money to make sure that they continue. Uh, they don't need to be major projects, but if you give a mutual aid group a thousand dollars to reimburse people for gas who do errands for people, you've gone a long way to making sure that people are safe for two and three months at a time. You know, a lot of times we think about things in terms of line items. Well, where can that fit in our budget? How does it fit to our, our reporting goal? And I'd really challenge the system itself to flip that thinking. And instead of where does it fit into a program, how can we make the work that needs done be a program somebody will want to pay for? And that's tough, but I think that challenge is in front of all of us. Because if we don't start utilizing some innovative approaches, we are reaching a point where, uh, you know, disability services is the largest portion of the Medicaid budget in Pennsylvania. We are constantly told that by elected officials. And part of the answer is, okay, then let's look at what we can do from the other side of that to contain medical costs. But a big part of that is what other innovations can we bring to the table that enable people to get the supports they need in a way that doesn't look like traditional support models. Another thing we need, and perhaps the most important thing we need as people with disabilities, is to capitalize on our own power. It starts with voting. I know that a lot of people were really upset by the vote by mail issue. I'm a person who prides myself on being somebody who always makes it to the polls. But we have to remember that vote by mail gives access to everyone, but they didn't do it right this time. It took a lawsuit against the Department of State to release a ballot that was accessible to voters with visual disabilities. And even that assumed that those people would have access to screen reading software and printers to print their ballot and mail it. We, had, we took a good first step, but we've got a long way to go. And that doesn't mean we abandon the crusade for accessible polling places because our first exercise of power is at the ballot box. Beyond that, people need to stay in touch with their legislators, connected. They need to know who we are, not just because we have things to ask for, but because we have things to offer. I volunteer for animal rescue. And one of the things that I've been able to do is to help people who want to adopt animals. And a couple of those have been uh, people in places of power who call me and say, we know that you wrote that grant for that rescue. Uh, what do you think about us getting a dog from them? And I'm able to provide a reference. That's just one example of how you can leverage skills that you have to give somebody something they need and not always be the person on the other end asking for more because I will always ask for more. But in the other hand, I've got to have something to give you, something that makes me memorable in your experience of interacting with a person with a disability more than just this person takes, this person uses the system, this person uh, needs resources. We have to be a resource while we need resources. And all of us have things to offer. And not all those things are super obvious. <laughs> We might look at somebody who has a more significant disability than mine and say, well, we have to, we, we have to monitor our expectations for somebody because they communicate differently. And if we do that, we're shortchanging not only that individual, but ourselves for the things that they might be able to offer to us. And 
when we begin to, to really embrace the idea of capitalizing on our own power, we start thinking more broadly. Economic power. How many of us know about disability-owned businesses? How many of us think about whether or not a business that we shop in has a 14C certificate? How many of us say, well, I know that restaurant has three steps, but they also have a really killer pad thai. And I don't have anybody in my party that has a, a mobility need tonight, so it's okay. When we start backing up our values with our dollars, we will see things change. When we start really living the value of access for all, we will see a major change. And that's hard to do. It is very hard to do. But if we look to other movements, and this is where we're gonna talk about those valued intersections, we can gain power and strength from people beyond the disability community. We have to get together. The Black Lives Matter movement is also about my life. Why? Because I need to make sure that the police on the streets are protecting me appropriately or that they're they're taken out of the, the power to do so because any of us who is vulnerable is is at the mercy of those who are in power and as we take our own power we're going to see some shift in that and it's going to be uncomfortable for a while but we need to work together so you know when we think about protests that happen and no one likes protests, right? It makes everybody uncomfortable, unless you're a rabble rouser like a few of us on this panel today. When we think about people hitting the streets, we should never say, that's not my issue. Every issue that matters to the quality of our community should matter to us. And we need to hold organizers accountable to make sure that the actions around those issues are accessible we need to offer our voices and our bodies to their power and the things that matter on, on a day-to-day -day shifting basis to the best that we're able. I'm not advocating anybody to put themselves at undue risk, but we need to be willing to speak up. If you can't be in the streets, make a phone call, write a letter, help paint signs. My, my least physically demanding job as a protest volunteer at one time was to spell check the protest signs. <laughs> so any way that you can participate to lend something to an effort is a value. You know, when we talk about the disability rights movement and the 504 sit-in that happened to force the regulations to be issued for 504, there were Black Panthers that fed those protesters on a nightly basis. There were women's rights activists who came to make sure that people had access to clean water and shampoo. Uh, we have to participate in social justice as a global issue and not just as neat little boxes that we all fit into because the more we do that, the more the people in power, the more the people that decide the purse strings pit us against one another. I've worked in disability services for close to 25 years. I've known Guy since he had dark hair. <laughs> we, we have to start building things together in a more global basis if we want to see real movement. You know, I, I have another 25 years to be doing this work. And what I really want to see is that I want people to drive past an action that we might have and not know what the issue is until they actually stop and ask. Because I don't want them to see that, you know, oh gee, that's a crowd of folks of color, or that's a crowd of people who use wheelchairs. I, I want people to really come together. And that's a hard charge to live by. It doesn't lend itself to a lot of rest and contentment. But if we build each other up, we can, we can get this done, we can move forward. Roland says, who's in charge? And my mantra has been for a long, long time, go inspire yourself. When people see me out in public and they are, you know, so amazed that maybe a group of uh, 
three or four wheelchair users are out buying groceries or out having dinner. Uh, and that happens a lot, even today. It really, really bothers me because I don't exist to inspire. I might exist to exasperate, but I don't exist to inspire. And it's really important to me that people realize if you're going to say that, if you're going to say to somebody, I'm really inspired by seeing you out in public today. To, to borrow a phrase from other friends, what are you gonna do about it? What is, what is that inspiration? <laughs> because it has to be more than just a feel good moment. You know, if you're inspired by just seeing me out getting groceries, you need a life. And I'll help you get it. Come learn about what matters to us. And Brenda, I think that we need to live that charge ourselves as well. Brenda, thank you so much for uh, sh sharing all of that. It's, it's uh, very powerful in regards to the role that we need to play and uh, we look at change. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Uh, Mary, do you have some questions from the uh, attendees that uh, you can share um, with us that we can maybe uh, talk about? Oh boy, we have a lot of questions and a lot of comments. I just want to suggest first off that um, I think Jamie's conversation really inspired uh, a, a discussion here. Um, certainly um, supportive of um, full integration in the community, but still understanding challenges that exist within the community. Um, Monica still um, said something, you know, that we all know, but it, it, it's one of sort of those basic things that I think uh, we, we, we still haven't fixed. And she said that some providers need to learn the social model of disability. I saw that a lot in home care, not trusting the person or their choices. And that sort of goes beyond, you know, our typical disability community, maybe even the senior community and people who serve people in a medical capacity and just don't give rights to the person who actually is receiving the services to make their own decisions. Um, and then we saw a lot of conversation about where the system isn't working. And I think to Jamie's point that, um, you know, if we're going to do this, and, and to Brenda as well, if we're going to do this, we have to fund it really well. Um, people need to make sure they're getting access to uh, the services that they wish and how they're going to actively live in the community. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit uh, about this sort of general education piece. How do you propose making sure the general public understands the final rule and welcoming people with disabilities into the community and all kinds of housing situations and opportunities that that currently exist um how how is how is that transition being made between um for instance the closure the closure of polk let's just use that as an example and the community and maybe i wonder if uh if nancy Thaler could talk about that and then maybe brenda with her experience with um nursing home transition um sure um i i started in the field in 1971 before penhurst was filed and um pretty much that whole time i joined the start working in the system in order to open a group home for people leaving penhurst and all through those years, I worked in provider agencies and in state government. And for decades, people would keep saying, we have to educate the public. We have to educate the public. And I never could understand how we would do that because any effort to do that is sort of artificial. And I, this is sort of a easy, I don't mean this to be an easy way out, but what I could see is that the presence of people in the community did it and that it's really a person at a time and i'll give you a little tiny example my husband and i when we moved to harrisburg uh, my son aaron uh who has disabilities was with us and um my next door neighbor was in the backyard the new next door neighbor and my and aaron was about to go out the back door to talk to the next door neighbor and sometimes Aaron's hard to understand. And so I was going to go out behind him to explain Aaron to our next door neighbor. 
And as I was about to do that, my husband said, yo, Nancy, come in here. And Aaron kept going. And I said to my husband, what did you want? And he said, let Aaron meet Michael next door. He doesn't need you to interpret him. And he was right. It's, we have to create constant opportunities. That's why the ADA gives people physical accessible accessibility. We have to remove social barriers, but I do believe that presence is what changes everybody. And that puts a big obligation on providers and government people to write rules and implement services in the truest inclusive way possible. Every job coach out there who's helping somebody find a job and navigate the workforce is doing it. The 14C certificate holders who are keeping everybody in the building are not doing it. And so the barriers have to be removed by the allies and the people, frankly, getting paid to do it. Great, thanks. And Brenda, so I just want to let you know that I think you're going to be um, put on the slate for President of the United States. Um, <laughs> you, you got tremendous response here on your comments. Um, can you talk a little bit about ensuring that people with disabilities can get access to what they need in the community and how that does happen or can happen? Well, as I said, our first exercise of power is at the ballot box. So if disability issues matter to you, ask the questions of your candidates, seek the information, uh, get in touch with disability services organizations that are consumer led and consumer driven. Speaking for ourselves is one. Centers for Independent Living are another great source, but there are other organizations as well. Anyone who wants to is welcome to call me and we can talk about that. I know that we have members of our audience who head some terrific grassroots groups and it's out there, but people have to reach out and, and really want to connect so that they can learn about how to affect change. Uh, we need to get more people with disabilities running for office and Hopefully that's not me because I, I, I enjoy speaking. I enjoy sharing my story with people. I enjoy sharing other people's stories with the world. I don't necessarily enjoy the idea of what modern politics has turned into for a lot of reasons. Um, not only that, but I don't know if people know this, there is not one single accessible bathroom in the Pennsylvania Capitol. There are a lot of one that try, but there's not one single accessible bathroom in the Pennsylvania Capitol, and they're hard to come by in Washington, D.C. So <laughs> that's that's my excuse for a reasonable accommodation of not running for office until the presidency is a remote position. Let me uh, just, um, uh, Brenda, let me just jump in for a sec to make a comment. Sure. Nancy has a comment. I, I think one of the ways we can do this is that, um, and then the movie Value Being Alive says some people may be looked at, I mean, one, of, one of the things that occurs to people with disabilities is, is the question of stigma and how people are perceived. And they're perceived as either sick or as children or as menaces or as pity and charity. And as long as those sort of messages keep being given about people with disabilities, then it's going to be the handouts that you get. So I think part of it is, as you described, Brenda, it's being in valued roles, whether that's a volunteer, having a job, being a church member, being an artist, being an athlete you know, being a friend to someone, being an aunt, being an uncle, whatever it is, until people are seen as people and not in these other per perceptions that um, the stereotypes that we hold. And um, so I think that's a, a big piece of it too. Uh, Nancy, you have a comment? Um, only that, that one of the participants, her name is Kelly, I think, or his name is Kelly, I'm not sure, has um, iterated a number of examples of the shortcomings in the community system that I think can be discouraging. And I just want to say that keep it up. I mean, if we don't call out when we're not doing it right, or if we don't call out when there's shortcomings, we're not going to change anything. So if the group home down the street doesn't look so nice, call up the provider association or the county and say, you know, you're not doing anybody any favors. And I, I don't think that um, any of us here on the panel are so, have such rosy glasses that we think once everybody's out in the community, everything's perfect. No, the providers, support people have to live the values of what is behind community services. Um, so you're right, there are shortcomings and mm -hmm. we got to keep focused on them. I like that. Um, um, Guy, can I say something? One of the things that I'm um, speaking for myself did 
Um, we got seven people out of Woodhaven, um, and that was one of the issues we dealt with. Um, we have survived. One of the agencies that we were dealing with for this individual, uh, I suggested to have an open house. Now he was getting ready to move into the community, and we were talking about how is that going to be done. And we worked with the fire agency, and we figured out. Um, and we came up with the idea, what about an open house, uh, which means let the community knew that this person was coming in and people come over and do an open house to, you know, welcome to this, uh, welcome this person. And that's exactly what we did. We followed the process. Um, that was a suggestion um, that never happened before. And they started thinking that that's a good idea. Let's invite the community in. Um, you know, to introduce ourselves. Like when I first moved into this house, I just moved to the Northeast and a woman came into my uh, my brother's house with a thing of cookies. Mm -hmm. So um, that was one of the things that we suggested um, to help people get used to going into, the, I mean, to, um, and the family was involved in this as well. And they thought it was a good idea as well to, um, have open house invite the community in and that's exactly what they did for this individual um some of the community people their next door neighbors neighbors came in and welcomed this individual that had a disability um that just came out of white woodhaven we had seven people one of the seven people we got out of woodhaven um and then the following week uh we had another meeting i was at and the mother was there and the family was there and they um they thought it was a really good idea well, thanks, and that thanks, was thanks, that was one of the things that we we um try to come up with and uh, when we i came up with the idea that we had to think outside of the box thanks deb i think that's a great idea people have been commenting that that's a great idea to have um we have a few minutes left so what i would like to do is just ask the panelists to very briefly so where are we going to be in five years from now? We're celebrating the 30th year of the ADA, you know, ADA 35. What do you see, you know, for, you know, for the community, for you know, people's lives? Um, Brenda, you want to give it a shot? What, you know, what are you envisioning five years from now? I really hope that I see a situation where we have the ability to provide home and community-based services in every state in our nation that are, that are seamless. I really hope that we begin to embrace economic empowerment for people with disabilities. We still uh, embrace poverty in the disability community in ways that would shock most people. Mm -hmm. The fact that if you're an SSI recipient, you can't have more than $2,000 in assets. Well, it's really hard to think about purchasing a home if that's the way things are done. And there are trusts and there are programs, but ultimately they limit people's economic power. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that we begin to erase some of those structural systemic things that hold people down into it, an economy of poverty um, in order to receive the services they need to live. That's the biggest change I want to see in five years. Thanks, Brenda. Jamie, can you share your perspective? Sure, Guy. I mean, I think for me, um, as you know, I have a passion for employment and the employment of people with disabilities. So one of the things I would like to see five years from now is that we can look across Pennsylvania and see that we no longer have any 14C uh, certificates and that people with disabilities are being paid real wages. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think I would say is that I hope that when we come five years from now, uh, we have a fully implemented HCBS final rule and we have adequate uh, funding to support home and community-based services. Good, well, thank you so much. And it's interesting how with the COVID-19, uh, many people with disabilities are being hired to work from home, like uh, a lot of us are doing right now, uh, and showing their value and their worth and how it can be done. So um, I'm in agreement with the employment, a very important issue. Debbie, how about yourself? What, what do you see us in five years? What would you like to see? Well, I, I would like to see us um, people with um, disabilities of all kinds um, have more control and more power uh, and decision making of what they want out of their life. And I hope to see all the institutions um, across Pennsylvania and the world 
um, we close and people have equal rights in to live however they want to live and the choices they want to make. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. It's very powerful. Uh, Nancy, can you share your perspective? Uh, yeah, I'm going to be really concrete here um, and specific to Pennsylvania. So um, I appreciate uh, Bre Brenda and Debbie's vision for a quality of life. Um, I'm going to kind of talk about the people who don't have anything. So my hope would be in the next five years is that there wouldn't be any more waiting lists and those people who have nothing have the supports they need to participate in the community, that the, the facilities, state facilities, be closed responsibly and people in the community. And we need to remember that in Pennsylvania, there are now more people living in private institutions than there are in state run institutions. We have a lot of private run state institute or private run institutions that the state funds. So we need to get Pennsylvania, like Vermont, New Hampshire, and other, uh, Oregon, out of the institution business completely. That needs to be our goal. Five years, probably a little ambitious, but we should be much further along. First step in that, Nancy, we have to stop calling them nursing homes. They are facilities. They are home to no one. <laughs> and if we start forcing that thought, we'll go a long way to getting to where you want to be. Right. Yeah, just... Um, comment I'd, I'd like to make. I think we've learned so much uh, in the intellectual disability world, um, you know, from just years and years of advocacy, like speaking for ourselves, lessons learned from families, the, uh, the, the ARC movement and the UCP movement. Um, and we have a, a whole new set of parents now with children with disabilities that, and the label being autism. And um, I, I'm, I hope that, um, we can share our history and learn from one another because I, I'm very fearful that we're sort of going backwards in some sense and, and you know, 